And again, I guess that is my cue to get started. And the, the car is gone. The German radio is gone. So, hallo und willkommen zum DevSecops Roadshow in Deutschland. Mein Name ist Brian Vermeer und ich bin ein Developer Advocate für Sneak. Um, und ich bin hier mit meinem Kollegen und uh, Co-Moderator Matt Jarvis. Uh, leider, mein Deutsch war gar nicht so gut. Und ja, um, yeah, es gibt Leute hier who, um, unter uns, die keine Deutsch sprechen. That's why we will continue in English, basically, because I'm not proficient in uh, German. I try, I try. But uh, as we set the stage the last few days and we started the conversation within the local language, I did my best and I hope it makes sense, though. Uh, Matt, welcome. Yeah, That's well so done, Brian. You did, that was a lot better than me. I mean, I thought all Dutch people spoke every language on the in the world, don't you? We, we try, we can order our beers and our coffees and our, our, our sandwiches in basically every language within Europe or we try so that we can survive. That is, that is the basic mode we have. So where, whereabouts? I, well, actually, I don't really need to ask this question, but let's ask you anyway, Brian, where are you today? Where, what's your background there? Well, normally it's like the end of September, the start of October normally is the kickoff of Oktoberfest in Munich. So that's where my background currently is. Uh, unfortunately, it's canceled this year because of uh, COVID. Um, and if I am not mistaken that should be hamburg it is the uh, the hamburg uh, skyline of the uh, hamburg docks at night very nice place i spent a lot of time in in hamburg over the last few years so hello to all of my friends and colleagues there who may be listening to the stream so before we get on to our fabulous speakers today um we we've got our ongoing scores to settle brian and we so the, all this week brian and i have been quizzing each other about our knowledge of other european countries and i'm ashamed to say that i am currently living up to the stereotype of uh, ignorant english people who don't know many things about anywhere else Uh, so I have two days to uh, to restore my pride. So, Brian, do you want to start with the first question about Germany? Okay, let's so let's start about uh, with the first question about Germany. Um, currently, within the EU, within Europe, we have the euro as our currency. But before that, every every uh, uh, country had its own currency. What was the former currency uh, that Deutschland Germany had? The Deutschmark. Perfect, perfect. You're sending. You're 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 oh, climbing. The, you're climbing Thanks, the ladder. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Right. There. I, I think this is an easy one for you as well. I suspect. So, uh, what was my? Uh, so, what is the literal translation? The literal translation of the word Volkswagen. People's car. Indeed, people's car. So one H. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I will give you a slightly more difficult one. And it's about how Germany works, or, well, on paper. Uh, Germany is a federal state. It's the Bundesrepublik. And it consists of many, like, federate states. Uh, Bundesländer, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How many of these Bundesländer are there in Germany? I will give you a margin of two. Fifteen. It's 16, so within the margin, you're, you are correct. That, that was a complete guess. I should have actually done my research before these shows, but that was a fairly obvious one. I think you're going to get this one, uh, as uh, I wrote these way before uh, we were actually on air today. Uh, so what is the capital of Bavaria? Of Bavaria, Bayern. Munich. Munich? Yeah, I'll give you that. Yeah. Munich? Munich. I, that's that's what, I, what I would guess. Yeah. I think so. Okay. okay, last one. Last one for you. Um, what is the legal drinking age for beer in Germany? Because I'm at Oktoberfest. What is the legal drinking age for 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 say lower alcoholic drinks like beers and wines in Germany? I suspect this is going to surprise me. I'm going to say 13. That, that would that would be great. I would move over to Germany like ages ago. But um, if I'm correctly informed, it's 16. Oh, I nearly said 16, but I thought it, that would be too obvious. It was 16 in the Netherlands before, but they moved it up to 18. But uh, in Germany, it's still 16. Uh, so right. yeah, that I've got more questions, but uh, but uh, these were my three. Okay, so I have one my final question. In which year was the reunification of East and West Germany? 
1989. That's when the when the wall was uh, coming down. I think it was actually November 1989, if I'm not mistaken. That that I believe that was when the wall fell, but the actual reunification was in 1990. Okay, fair point, fair point. So the actual reunification was 1990, but I, I, I know from my history lessons that the wall fall, fall in November 1989, but hey, sure, sure, sure. Okay, no okay, cool. Thank you, Brian. I, I think I've, I've uh, reclaimed some of my dignity um, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll have the final round of the quiz on the Nordics tomorrow, which should be very interesting as there's lots of obscure facts about Nordic countries. <laughs> So our, our first um, speaker today, um, Sven Ruppert, is a uh, developer advocate at JFrog. And uh, uh, I'm going to pass the floor over to Sven. Thank you for joining us, Sven. Yeah, thank you for having me here. So I'm actually here in Germany as well, in Brunswick. So um, let's see what we can do. OK, perfect, perfect. So. Um, if there's any question, I think we have this chat window and otherwise the Q&A in the end. So don't hesitate to write it down. And let's see. So let's start. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the um, polyglot security roles or polyglot environments and the risk of vulnerabilities in this polyglot environment and uh, this from the point a developer will look at all this stuff. And some of you might know me already. I'm Sven, Sven from Germany, Brunswick, and I'm spending as much as possible time in the woods. So don't be surprised if you are going to one of my YouTube channels that you see me straight there sitting in the woods somewhere and talking about IT related stuff. So, well, today it's online. So no woods, but if you want to see a little bit more from me at this, since COVID started my YouTube channels and you have it in German, you have it in English, feel free to subscribe and you will get a bunch of other Java related and DevSecOps related things. But now let's talk about this Polyglot stuff. So Polyglot, um, Cloud Native is just an excuse here, so don't take it too seriously. But um, if you're looking a little bit around in the developer world today, you see that we start splitting up um, big systems and smaller systems called microservice functions, whatever. But what I'm saying is also working for monoliths or old legacy projects. This, um, this is not really a choice of the this architecture. It's more or less the choice of technologies we have look here today. So looking at the stack, so I'm throwing away all those different parts of um, microservice meshes and all this stuff and just looking at one tiny thing, so one application you're coding. Then let's say we, we start with the, with the application itself. So it's, it's really what, what you're coding by yourself. And uh, we will see later a little bit what, what our dependencies and what's uh, different between making your own stuff. But if, if you're adding a vulnerability or a compliance issue in this layer, it will be active in, in your layer. It will be active in the next one, next one, next one, because you have your application, you're wrapping it inside an application uh, operating system. This operating system will be used in some kind of virtual technology, Docker, whatever. I don't care about this one, it's the next layer. And then maybe in some, some Kubernetes universe, some, some managed um, environment where you're putting all these virtual environments and so on. Another thing what's forgotten is that you're focusing on, on vulnerabilities, for example, on, on the tech layer, but the most people are forgetting the whole tech stack itself. So for example, checking against vulnerabilities inside your CI environment. So, to say the truth, whoever checked his own Jenkins against vulnerabilities to see if this could be compromised somewhere. But the main thing here is that you can divide this uh, view on this one into a domain specific view and in technical view. So if you're looking at the domain specific view, there is really no tool support in terms of uh, this use, uh, use case is not safe, whatever safe means. Well, so, but in, if you're looking at the technical things, then you can see, oh, there is a vulnerability or this communication is not secure enough without saying what is going over the wire, but the communication itself is 
um, supported or to finalize uh, the security issues you have or to, to make sure there is nothing, there is a technical thing. And this technical issues can be solved by, by tools quite well. But I'm focusing mostly on vulnerabilities and compliance issues. And there is this term shift left. And this is why we're talking about polyglotting um, environment soonish uh, from the developer point of view, if you're rotating this picture and um, talking about what is the best point to eliminate vulnerabilities, then you're going shift left. So as early as possible in the production line. So it would be perfect if you have inside your IDE already all information about the issues that are coming in your application um, instead of just scanning it later in CI or even worse in production. So shift left is one of the terms. If you want to more, uh, know more about it, just type it to Google, read a little bit about it. But um, in general, what we can say is that in these environments we are, we are coding, we have always for every layer, some kind of repository. It means, for example, I'm a Java developer. So if I am start coding Java with my old Maven stuff, then I have a corresponding Maven repository. And everything I'm doing, I have to decide doing it by myself or should I buy it or so add the dependency. And all this dependency, all this stuff around my application, what I need to, to implement my use case is fetched of this Maven repository. And I'm as a Java developer, if I'm in my Java application, I see just my Java world. And then later, if I'm on Linux, maybe I have Debian repositories or Docker repositories and so on and so on. So for every layer, you have a corresponding uh, dependency manager that will give you access to a bunch of third-party products that you can grab and use inside of your application, inside your tech layer and so on. The most people are forgetting again, the whole tech stack that you're using, uh, for example, to produce yourself. So the whole CI pipeline, your own scripts, your compiler, your JVM, whatever. But this is more or less some kind of generic repository. You have to hold it somewhere because if you're talking about vulnerabilities and rolling back and forward between versions of compositions of your application, then it's mostly good if you have all this binary present and in an immutable way stored, because then you're independent from external repositories that they're holding it over a long time. But talking about polyglot environment, so whatever we are doing, I'm cutting again everything out and I'm just focusing now on my application. So what I as a developer I'm doing, and here I'm taking an example, this example is for example, Vardian is an open uh, source stack. And uh, what we have here is that you can write web applications. Okay, a lot of you are writing web applications or progressive web apps or whatever. And here it's, for example, a server-side web app. Hmm, nothing fancy, but if you're a Java developer, you want to stay in Java. But web apps are mostly in this NPM universe, web components, whatever. But in here, they've done some kind of abstraction. You have this web component, they're built on HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, so all this stuff you, as a Java developer, maybe not so really are fam familiar with. And then you need some kind of communication because you want to have a Java component where you're writing stuff and then maybe some test component because you want to write J on a five test against your web app. All good, all fine, it's open source for free. But what is now going on? What you as a Java developer see is, for example, the Java component, maybe some test components or whatever. You know there is some kind of communication, whatever technology is this one, and then there's this fancy web component in the, in the front. But you don't see it. You don't see it because you as a Java developer, you see on your classes, if you're mapping web components. By the way, if you want to know how to map web components to the Java side, I have a dedicated talk only about this technical thing on, on YouTube. But here, I just want to show you as a Java developer, you would see some annotation, for example, at npm package or at JS module. In the background, what's going on is that they start mapping technologies. For example, this annotation npm package is something that will lead to an npm install. And this npm install is a completely different technology. But you as a Java developer, you will not see it. Something during your Maven clean verify will do and you see some, some random log messages. But in the end, you're dealing with two life cycles. 
the JS module is something like an import statement on the NPM side. And this tag is something that's on the website. So really a HTML tag. So you will code in Java. You have your Maven lifecycle, but in the end, you will see something like this, just a Java class, nothing more. And on the front end, you'll see a nice badge or whatever you've created. What I want to say here is that you will use a bunch of technologies. And if you're focusing just on this technology on Java, maybe you're choosing tools that are just scanning the Java world, but you have in the background, the whole NPM stack, the whole NPM universe. So it means you are adding a dependency via Maven, but in the end, you're adding not only your Maven dependency and all the indirect dependencies, you are adding a whole new tech stack over NPM all NPM dependencies. And with this, you have a huge tree that you're creating this one dependency for you. It's just one point, but you need a technology that's aware of all these different technologies because somewhere in this tree, you can have vulnerabilities or compliance issues. You have always this time to market and make or buy. So time to market, you know, mostly ah, there's use case, you define this use case, you start coding it, and then it's just a technical parser. You have this requirement, you start coding it, you're testing it, you're pushing it to production. And this is optimized, it's fast. So there is no indirection, no review process or whatever from some other people out of your the production line. But if you're talking about vulnerabilities, I see quite often that there is a vulnerability, it's, it's a requirement, changing the dependency, for example. And then you have this requirement, not the, the final way to go from, I'm changing something, I'm pushing it to production. Sometimes you have these feedback loops inside your processes. So if you're starting with the DevSecOps world, or if you're dealing with this stuff, it really makes sense to treat the hunting of vulnerabilities in the same way as implementing use cases. So make sure that the process is fast and smooth and everything is automated so that just a change, the requirement to get rid of a vulnerability will be as fast as it's normal with a use case. Sometimes I see environments where this is a slower track than with the use cases. The same with make or buy. As a developer, we always know it's, it's um, should I write it by myself or adding a dependency? Adding a dependency is mostly done because should you write your PDF library by yourself? No, you should, shouldn't should reinvent the wheel. You are adding a bunch of dependencies, but then you have to trust them and checking the value between what you're doing by yourself and what is in dependency. Over all layers, you will see that the most parts are some kind of dependencies, some kind of managed binaries. But the whole inside your application, they're the biggest part, what you have done and what you're adding as a dependency. But focusing on dependencies makes sense because it's mostly the biggest part in your whole text stack anyway. And just as a recap, if you have this polyglot environments and if you have a Maven dependency, you're checking, for example, oh, that's an Apache license, it's good for me. But of the NPM border and going to all the other stacks, you have maybe some other compliance issues because they are dealing with other dependencies in some other repositories. It makes sense to check everything even over this technology border so that you are safe in terms of yeah, compliance issues, so license and all this stuff. Vulnerabilities is the same. Make sure that you are grabbing all dependencies, but there is a slightly difference with compliance issues. You have to replace a single dependency because it's in semantic equal implementation what you need so that you can change this. And on the vulnerability side, even if you're just in one layer looking for uh, vulnerabilities, could be one with a low CVSS value, but in combination of all the different tech layers you have, you can combine them to different attack vectors. And this could be, even if it is just a combination of lower risk vulnerabilities, something that really could hurt you. So it makes sense to check the whole stack, not only from application, operating system and so on, but even inside the stack, you have to, to check. What's the best safety belt against it? Well, TDD, test uh, testing is a really strong thing because fighting against vulnerabilities, if you identify them and have the knowledge there is something in, the best thing is if you can just use the same components 
in a different composition of versions and push it as fast as possible to production. What I'm recommending here that this efficient dependency management is one of the biggest weapons we have as a developer immediately in your hands and you're used to it. And if you're going with mutation testing, for example, a way stronger test coverage compared to pure line coverage, this will be an even smoother path of fighting against vulnerabilities. And have in mind, this must go over dependency, uh, over technology borders. Otherwise, you are maybe some, some kind of blind. And here in this example, you as a Java developer, you would see just the application and your Maven dependencies, but in the um, background, you're dealing with a complete new technology, new kind of dependency manager, new kind of vulnerability trees. So make sure that you are aware of all these different tech layers, even if they're hidden. And it's just a question of time that we are dealing more and more with these polyglot environments. By the way, if you want to see how I'm fighting against this in this Vardin stack on YouTube, I have there a dedicated YouTube video that I'm showing how I'm doing this and what I'm using. But in the end, I think I'm more or less done with the time. Hopefully right in time, I haven't checked it so far. So if you have any questions, let me, let me know. If you have different examples with different polyglot environments, let me know. I'm eager to learn more about this and see more and more examples. If you still uh, come up with questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we, ask, uh, we will ask Sven afterwards. But in the meantime, um, we have more uh, than, one, uh, than one speaker, of course. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Matthias Konrad. Uh, he is a so solution engineer. Uh, for for sneak and uh, yeah, I, I will talk about uh, uh, profiling uh, in in a second. But before we go into that, uh, let me quickly announce that we have some community sponsors uh, as well, like we have every every day. Uh, today, of course, uh, the virtual Java user group and uh, Fuji.io uh, are our main um, community sponsors that that help us out. And we want to have a big shout out to the DevSecOn community. Uh, that are always here and uh, interested in secure development. Uh, mm, so Matthias again, this is actually the chapter leader for DevSecOn Germany. That's what I wanted to start with. I, I mean, Def, uh, DevSecOn Germany. It has DevSecOn has different chapters all, all over the world, or we try. We are setting up uh, chapters all over the world. We have chapters now in in specifically in London. We have a chapter now specifically in India. But we also have a chapter that is lead uh, from Germany. And uh, Matthias is uh, is the is the chapter lead over there. So uh, welcome, Matthias. Uh, I would say the the virtual stage is yours. So uh, go ahead. Uh, and again, folks, if you have any questions for either Sven or Matthias, uh, please put them in the chat, and we can ask them afterwards. Matthias, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Brian. All right. So my topic today is uh, OSINT, uh, open source intelligence, and user profiling. Uh, my name is Matthias. I'm a solutions engineer at Sneak. And first, uh, I want to introduce a topic before I introduce myself, actually. So what is actually OSINT? So OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence. Uh, INT, or intelligence, is actually a military term for information gathering or reconnaissance. So basically, yeah, gathering of information of a target. Can be a user, can be a, a technical machine, doesn't really matter. Now, what's important here, data is being collected from publicly available sources. So the open in uh, OSINT refers to overt, publicly available uh, sources as opposed to covert. And then OSINT is actually obtained legally, it's publicly available. And as the CIA says, information does not have to be secret to be valuable. Now, actually, this is a website from the German Federal Intelligence Agency. They actually say, well, what makes us special is in German, but I just translated here. What makes us special? Well, intelligence agencies can do what's forbidden for others to spy. But actually, they also, uh, they also use OSINT, um, which is publicly available information uh, in the beginning of their reconnaissance. So they say here, OSINT, public information, doesn't matter if it's printed or digital, is often also the first step in reconnaissance by BND analysts. Now, who's actually using OSINT? And actually everybody. I mean, even we use OSINT while we actually not really recognizing it. Like for example, you know, you, you're, you're going on a date, on a personal level, you're going on a date, you, 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 you know, search somebody on Google and so on. It's also basically OSINT in the end, right? So I would say almost everybody is using OSINT. Of course, HR uh, and recruiters are using it, intelligence agencies are using it, journalists, other business, for example, insurances, 
uh, you can use it for credit scoring, but also my focus in the past is always where is OSINT being used by marketers, especially uh, for you know, um, enriching user profiles, for targeted marketing, for personalization, but then also since I'm now a sneak, I look at it more on the aspects of uh, security. So as a hacker, as a, a security consultant, how can I? How is OSINT being used? Obviously, it's uh, being used in the recon phase of a typical social engineering attack. So a bit of background and context. So myself, I have a background in software engineering. I work at a very data privacy focused open source company called Nextcloud, where they offer an alternative to Google Drive and Dropbox, where they say, well, if you don't want your information to be scanned by others, you better host it yourself. Then I also moved on. I have a background in customer identity and access management. That's where OSINT is also relevant when we talk about identity and, and user profiles. And then now, currently, I'm uh, with Sneak. Uh, so I'm now in the DevSecOps space, and especially the security part is here important in the context of OSINT. I'm also sort of a certified uh, information privacy technologist from the IAPP, which is the International Association of uh, privacy, privacy Professionals. So I did a lot of reading in the past year, some books uh, that deal with how is customer or consumer data actually being used or misused uh, so these are a few books I can really recommend, Weapons of Mass Destruction or The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, Automating Inequalities. Basically, sometimes we gather information or others gather information and make wrong assumptions, right? They categorize you in certain uh, yeah, categories or make wrong assumptions and you kind of get red flagged maybe by your insurance company and so on. It's quite interesting. Now, <clears throat> but today we are at the DevSecOps Road trip, right? So, how does it fit into DevSecOps and why does it matter? Now, the goal of OSINT is maybe in the marketing space, it's about user and identity profiling. I want to uh, do a targeted marketing campaigns and so on. Makes sense, but this is not what I'm going to address today. Then, also, of course, for crime investigations or other kind of investigations. But also, now this is where the security aspects come into play. Let's say in your software, you find, or the attacker finds a vulnerability in the victim software, right? So there's a web application, there's a vulnerability you can exploit, but then also when you do an exploit, you often rely actually uh, on the user to play along. So that said, I mean, like uh, in order to actually do the exploit, you rely on the user clicking a certain link, right? So this link must be provided to the user in some way, maybe in a well-crafted phishing email, or maybe you want to you know, make a fake phone call and impersonate somebody else and uh, you know, asking the user to give out information. So this is where actually social engineering or slash OSINT comes into play in uh, you know, conjunction with uh, DevSecOps or the security aspects of this year. Now let's say, Let's say I'm an attacker. I want to uh, find out information to, you know, craft a story that I can tell the my victim, right? So, or maybe if if in the marketing uh, uh, sector, if you have a website and the user logs in with only one single piece of information, it can be an email address, a username, or just a phone number, maybe. Then I have a single piece of information, and that's all, nothing else. So I don't know much about my user. So what do I actually know about the user? Well, maybe I know the email address, I'm, I know the username, or I know the phone number, one piece of information. So if I'm lucky, maybe I, the email address is in a pattern that is like first name, last name. Of course, this is perfect, and I know the obvious name of the person. But maybe I'm not that lucky, but let's assume I have the name. Now, the question is, what can I do? And if I'm not like, Let's say I'm the attacker or somebody with a, something uh, malicious in mind. If I'm not Google and Facebook, I don't own the uh, internet infrastructure and uh, the different you know, ad servers and so on, ad technologies. Let's say I'm just a, a simple attacker. So what tools are actually out there that you can use? And also there are a few books and resources out there uh, about OSI, but they are very US centric. They don't really work well in Europe or Germany. So I just did a bit of research a while ago to see what's actually working still and what's not anymore. So obviously let's say you uh, you want to, because attacks are getting more and more sophisticated, automated in a way, 
maybe you want to attack at scale, so which means automated. So let's say you get a list of usernames or email addresses and so on. You want to enrich the profiles to do a proper uh, attack here. So <clears throat> of course, when I get a list, uh, a name, let's say I have a username or a first name, and maybe it's not only German names or European names, maybe it's from India, China, and so on. I might not always know the gender. So I can use here gender APIs where I pass on a name, like a first name, and I can find out the gender. This is very primitive, very basic, of course, nothing special here. Uh, there are a lot of APIs out there, but I can even go further. <clears throat> this is more convenient. There are people search engines out there. Now, people search engines such as people, for example, PIPL. I found this is uh, we are, uh, the best one out there, probably. Uh, I can pass on a name, maybe first name, last name, or maybe just an email address, or maybe just a phone number, and I get a lot of information back. This information is from various sources. So on the left-hand side, you can see the form that I used to search by, in this case, by name. And then on the right, I get back usernames. I get back gender, languages, uh, addresses. So like the city where I was living, past jobs. And this information, it can be from obvious sources like LinkedIn, but also it holds old data. It's like an internet archive. So maybe there's an email address or a, um, a phone number in there that I don't use, but I used it five years ago or 10 years ago. It will still be in there. So it's like a kind of the web archive where you can look up all websites, but for user profile data. Uh, another example here is where I look by search by email address, or I only search by the phone number. And I also get back on the right, you can see here, phone numbers, past phone numbers, um, date of birth, for example, and so on. So a lot of information in there. Um, then also what's important, uh, <clears throat> sometimes you get back an image, like an avatar image, and I call this a reference image, which will be important later on. So it's not only textual data, it can also be images. Why this is important, I will show you in a bit. Um, sometimes in this uh, information, you're not, you don't get back the username, for example, the Twitter handle, and you might just get back a numeric number. In this case, there are reverse uh, lookup engines where you can just pass the, in this case, the Twitter ID, and then it will give you actually back the actual username that you can then use. So this is like just a reverse ID search. Now there are other people searches, uh, but I found the people was is most uh, useful. Um, so full contact is also uh, well known. It has little data. Most of it is just comes from basically um, what's on LinkedIn anyway. So it's not that interesting. It doesn't contain historic data. Spookio is they don't offer a trial. It's very US centric. Tower data give, didn't give me any results. It's also very US centric. Now, so up to this day, let's say I'm pretty Googleable. I have a, I use online services a lot. So maybe what, what might somebody know about me? Well, email addresses, usernames, jobs, addresses, phone numbers, mobile or landlines, education background, languages, user IDs, social profiles, names, date of birth or the age range, maybe profile images and the gender. Now, based on that, <clears throat> let's say I get the information that I have a certain uh, user handle on Twitter. Now I can go from there. As an attacker, I want to see, okay, what other information is out there? What other services is this user using? Now, very often the user uses the same username. So I always use Matthias Conrad. I don't have to, but I do it. So there are certain uh, checks, like name check, where you can look where this, um, at which other services this user handle is being used. Now, okay, this gives me an idea where I might look at to get further information. However, Let's say I'm, it's not Matthias Connor, maybe it's just John Smith, right? John Smith is very common, a very common name. So how, how do I know that the John Smith on Twitter is the same John Smith on Instagram, right? Or somewhere else. So uh, how can I be sure it's the same user? And um, I will show this in a bit, but then also let me point out there are other tools out there. For example, this is a tool, MyTigo. It's a standard tool that is pre-installed on Kali Linux, for example. Uh, where you can uh, look up a username and it will also do the same what I showed you before. Uh, it's just a different tool. It will give you the information where this uh, user handle is being used at other services. For example, here at Facebook, Google, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. 
it's just an indication it doesn't have to be has to be the same user but it's the same username that's being used there then here for example i i search by name also in my tigo this tool i search by my first and last name i get back um all my different email addresses I have or I had in the past, pretty much aggregated across, uh, from the uh, what's out there on the internet or what's out there in the past. Now, coming back to the reference image, why is this important? As I said, maybe sometimes I use the same image at all my services. Maybe I use the same on GitHub, on Twitter, on Instagram, and so on. It's always the same image. That's then easy to compare, um, but it's not always the case, right? So. How can I make sure that I'm looking up information from the same person? And this is where the reference image comes into play. So of course, there's always Gravatar. Gravatar um, allows me to, um, in case I don't get a reference image, I can uh, query Gravatar by the email address and I would maybe get back a reference image if the user provided one in Gravatar. Now, what's more interesting is uh, there's a, <clears throat> a website, Face++, it has a face recognition API and image comparison. So it means, let's say, this is simple. I have two different image, but the same image is obviously the same person. Let's say on the left-hand side is a user on Twitter. On the right is the user on Instagram. I want to know, is this actually the same user? Because it's, it's using the same username, but I'm not sure if it's the same John Smith on Instagram and Twitter. So what I can do is here, uh, uh, face uh, recognition comparison, and it gives me the information, okay, the probability that this person is the same is very high. Then here, even you can see on the right-hand side, it's not a very clear picture. It's a, a photo where the face is quite small. It's not really clear to see. The eyes are pretty halfway closed, but still it's able to recognize that the probability that this is the same person is very high. And just to guarantee that it's not a fake service, I compared my own uh, picture with uh, this of the other person and the probability is very low. So this tool allows me to make sure that I'm looking at the different online services of the very same person and not just different person it does have to be, have, uh, happen to have the same name like John Smith. Now the, easy, the, the other approach is you can do a reverse image search on Google or other services, but there you really have to have the same image and not just a similar one where the, let's say the eye or the face is similar. It really has to be the same image. And this would also allow you to, you know, get other pages or services that the user might be using. Of course, in the end, I would think that you want to automate this, or I mean, the attacker uh, who are going for sophistic sophisticated attacks, they want to automate, they want to attack in a, larger scale, right? They don't want to go manually in here. So they can use some kind of scraping scripts and so on to get this automated. This is also important. Let's say I have reference image and this is called pimice.com. So I can upload an image and they do the record, they do the face recognition as well, but I don't provide a second image. I just upload one image and they will tell me on which other websites this same person it doesn't have to be the exact same picture, but the same person where the, you know, the eye parts or the face is similar uh, comes up. So it's very similar to a image reverse search, but a bit more, uh, you know, uh, it gives a bit, a bit uh, other way of uh, uh, providing the information that uh, Google reverse search or uh, face plus plus didn't do. So that was the reference image, why it's important to have this. Now, obviously on Twitter, this is also very obvious, uh, but of course, what's actually possible there, uh, think of um, wanting to automate things here. If you have a Twitter, obviously it's the, it has to be a public uh, account. So here I have my usual uh, Twitter account. And um, what's important, what's interesting there is if I use tools to analyze a Twitter account, there's quite some interesting information because remember we want to uh, create a story or want to actually paint a picture of this user as if we really know him. So uh, follow along is a tool to analyze a Twitter account. It shows you, for example, what languages do, do the followers or the people I this person follows speak. So obviously it seems that I'm probably German and I also speak English, but also what are in the world, because I, for example, I lived in China for eight years. You can see here on the uh, bottom left, 
I have a lot of followers or I follow a lot of people in China and Hong Kong also lived in the US. So you can see there are a lot of people from California, for example, and then obviously from Germany. So you can understand that what regions or geographical regions are important for a user, you know, when you craft your fake phishing mail, right? So, and then also the, there's a word cloud. The word cloud means um, what are the important or relevant topics that I care about of people that I follow on Twitter, right? What are, are these people uh, dealing with? Obviously, it's about security software, uh, open source of Germany, California, San Francisco there. So this is like the, yeah, the world that I'm as a user living and interested in. This is a world, a world cloud of my own account. So not this of, the follow, of my followers or people I follow or follow me, but this is my own. So based on my tweets, I get this kind of word cloud of to, um, topics uh, that I tweet about, right? A lot of open CMS, meetups, China, Android. So this is also interesting to get the idea of uh, the interest of a person. And then on Instagram, very similar. It's the same concept here. There are tools like Instaloader where you can actually uh, automate things. Instaloader is a script where it passes basically a public account, an Instagram account. It loads the, um, the messages, the words. So you can also create a word cloud there. But also on the right there, you can also fetch the images. And then once we have the images, you can of course process them in the same way and get information out of these images. So coming to the images, there's actually a lot of lot more information in images than you might think. So this is, uh, these are two photos I took. <clears throat> one on the left, obviously it's at Hard Rock Cafe, but which one, we don't know. And there's um, a motorbike I had in the past on some trip I did, and it's also just that picture. <clears throat> so none of these pictures have access data. So there's no geo uh, location in the metadata of the picture because the pictures are cropped or uploaded to social media. Now still there are services like let's say Google Vision, once you pass the image, they can actually tell you this is the Hard Rock Cafe in Venice. Even I didn't provide the information to anywhere, but they know based on the picture and comparison to other pictures or photos from other users, they know that this is obviously Hard Rock Cafe Venice. So there's more information uh, even without access data in pictures than you might think. Then also <clears throat> uh, Google Vision API, they can get information like what you see on the picture. It's a building, it's a facade, it's an outlet store. Uh, they can recognize logos like you see on the right. This would also be interesting for marketing purposes more, more than for attackers, but still uh, they can recognize logos, they can recognize text. <clears throat> Here's an example. For example, uh, the picture on the left, it shows a presentation, very small print, right? It's hard to read even as a, as a human, but still the Google Vision API is able to get the text from the slides. So it says, for example, here in Germany, it says it's about uh, air pollution in a certain district in Stuttgart. So you know what topic it was that this, uh, um, the, uh, at the event that the user attended potentially, right? Or on the right, hardly noticeable, but there's actually a restaurant. The restaurant has a name, a sign uh, on it. And it says, it, it, um, Google Vision, is able to actually see it from quite far away. It says Krumbachtal, which is a, a restaurant or a region here in Stuttgart, for example. So there's a lot of information that you as a user might not pay attention to, but the Google Vision API or other tools are able to get out of it. Now, this is an, coming to the next one. Next topic, brand, brands, logos, brand preferences. This is very obvious, it's a basketball. Um, a picture I took is recognizing spoiling, so very clear. But then even for smaller like pictures where you have small logos or not that obvious in the front, you can still get the information. For example, here's a, here's a picture somebody flew with Delta Airlines. So, okay, it's uh, just a small logo on a ticket, but then still you can see here uh, Brandwatch, this is the tool that's being used here, Brandwatch Image Insights, it's able to recognize that okay, this person obviously flies with Delta, or, you know, this person uses an iPhone, this person uh, prefers Nike as a, you know, a brand for the clothes and so on. So this is 
well, more in towards the you know targeted marketing and brand preferences. But it's interesting to see what's actually actually possible and what kind of tools are out there. There are a few other image recreation services. I just list them here for references without going into much details. Uh, but yeah, the obvious obvious one from the cloud providers, there's Google Vision API, there's Amazon recognition and so on. Then the last part, this is now of course a very, very obvious, but sometimes you have really users and this is this talk that I give now, I also uh, do it in more in the context of security awareness, more for not so technical users. Let's say sometimes people review articles somewhere on Amazon or eBay, right? Sometimes really are not very careful of what kind of information they provide. For example, here is a profile of a person that I randomly found on, on Amazon. I'm married, uh, older than 30 years old, and I'm a mom of twin, uh, twin uh, boys. So this is very detailed information. Sometimes you have the, if you think of a semantic AI who is able to parse and understand context of a text, you can also get information from this kind of reviews. Here it's about, yeah, my daughter is uh, now one and a half years old, right? So really get information about family status and more and details that, um, you know, you don't want to give into the hands of, uh, of uh, malicious users. So, um, so in the end, based on just one single factor like email address or username or name, I can actually possibly get more information. I already summarized the ones on the left. Then I can get information like purchase history, reviews, family status, hobbies, relevant topics, brand preferences. And all this information now allows me to craft a story that I can use in a phishing email or in a fake phone call or something. And sometimes depending on the value of the victim, like whatever you try to do as an attacker, sometimes these kind of reconnaissance can uh, last maybe of over a few months to prepare yourself for the right attack, for the right wording and so on. So this is just, um, yeah, that's it. So that, that's my, my, my uh, end of the, this talk. So I just wanted to show you that social engineering OSINT uh, also plays a role in when we talk about DevSecOps or the sec part of it, it also plays a role, especially in the first phase of it, when it's the reconnaissance phase. That's it. And uh, let's see if there are some questions. Thank you, uh, Matthias. It is, it is interesting to see that with, with basically information that you just put on the internet, you can, you can scrape a whole profile of somebody. And it, it, it's actually mind blowing that, for instance, if I call my telephone provider and ask for a new plan, that they only ask like, uh, just to make sure that it's you, what is your date of birth and where do you live? And like, that is publicly available everywhere. So you can pretend to be somebody else like quite easily in many, many official cases, uh, just by posting your pictures and, and putting stuff online. So yeah. it's also, I think it's also a wake up call through to, to basically the whole community or the whole society that we, uh, that this information is almost for everybody freely available. And we should take care of that um, in a matter of how do we check out that the people that calling you are actually the people that call, that are calling you. Indeed. Interesting. Yeah. yeah interesting. In interesting story. Um, so far, uh, for both uh, uh, speakers, you were, I think you were just totally clear on everything, or people are just afraid to ask questions. It can be either or, but there are, at this point, there are no questions. However, um, I put in for both of you, I put in your Twitter handle. So if you feel like you have questions afterwards, I always have this when after lunch, when I'm in the shower or doing other things, like completely zoomed out. I'm like, ah, this was the question I had to ask that specific uh, specific uh, speaker. Feel free to um, to reach out to them. I think Twitter would be the best way, so that's why I put uh, put this up for most folks in the in the tech universe. Uh, Twitter is their go to social media, but feel free to uh, to point out to the specific users or the specific speakers if you have any questions about their talks. Um, Thanks for that, Brian. We now have the uh, image of you in the shower to uh, to leave the show with. So uh, yeah, it's not. I I just I just wanted to wanted to put the actual picture up, but I just look. learned from Matthias that, that that will be that will be scraped and scanned, that people know what the brand of my shower hat is. And no, we don't want that. We don't people. Uh, we don't, don't want people to know that I'm. Uh, well, never mind. 
So I guess uh, then we'll we'll wrap up for today's um, exciting instalment. Thank you to both of our speakers, Sven and Matthias. Um, uh, and join us for the final instalment of the uh, DevSecOps European Roadshow, where we will be in the Nordics tomorrow. Um, who who's joining us tomorrow for, to speak, Brian? Uh, let me check this. Uh, oh. Brian, it's your friend. Names, 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 names. Victoria Almazova. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, Philip de Rijk. So uh, both uh, both speakers uh, will be there. Philip, uh, I, I met a couple of times in real life. He is a great speaker. Uh, honestly, I don't know Victoria, uh, but she's been I, on this sitcom uh, before, and she's awesome and great. She but I see the question. topic uh, about best practices in securing CI/CD pipelines, which is some, which is something that I think mainly every developer uh, can relate to. So uh, I'm looking forward to 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 both talks uh, for tomorrow. Keep in mind, this will be published. So if you're like can we look this back later? Yes, you can. Sam will take care of that. It'll be on the YouTube channel later today. And if you didn't catch the UK or the Netherlands or the French stop, all those videos are now live on YouTube. If you'd like to go back and see what happened earlier in the week on our road trip. Great. Okay. So, Thank you. Thanks both. again, everyone. Have a lovely thanks again. afternoon. And Thank in you. my best German, I would say, I'll read it in. <laughs>